I will be trying to figure out today, with your help, is uh, what is a healthy jet diet? I mean, these jets are produced um, across a wide range of sources, uh, active galactic nuclei, uh, stellar explosions, binary mergers, uh, tidal disruption events, uh, you name it. Uh, you know, uh, black holes can explode stars uh, or galaxies. Uh, it all depends on what is the context into which we insert a black hole. Uh, basically, it just explodes anything you insert it into magnetically. Uh, and so that's exactly what I'm going to be talking about. So as you can see over here, the black hole is somewhere in the center. Uh, there is a gas going around the black hole, and it's producing these two perfect collimated jets. So since I have your attention, you're looking at me and I can do whatever I want with my hands and you can see that. So suppose this is a black hole. How would this black hole manage to produce this beautiful collimated outflow you see here? Well, um, think of it as uh, a, uh, a gym. Uh, there's a climbing rope attached to, to the ceiling on one end and to the other end to the black hole and you spin the black hole. And what it does, it winds up the climbing rope uh, and uh, this uh, winding of the climbing rope or our magnetic field line creates a magnetic spring, which is precisely what you see here. This is nothing but a magnetic spring that was uh, spun, that was twisted by the rotation of the black hole at the center. And it is the expansion of the spring outwards uh, that is taking away the energy and momentum and angular momentum from the central compact object, in this case, the black hole, and taking it out to the ambient medium, to, the, to infinity, basically, from the point of view of the black hole. And then when it smashes into the surrounding medium, then we can see a bunch of very interesting fireworks. So I wanted to take a brief stop here and ask uh, if anyone has any questions about this, and then I can move on. Yeah, so just to say, Sasha, that usually we ask questions at the end of the talk, so ah, don't feel sure, disappointed sure. if you don't <laughs> listen uh, uh, to people asking questions. Unless uh, there is a no question. Words, no words at all. No, no. I, I have a quick one and I will not answer yeah. another. My name is Nick Kilafis. Uh, we've Hi, never Nick. met uh, uh, Sasha. Uh, glad to see you even from uh, via screen. <laughs> Um, would too. you like to comment on, on the creation of the magnetic field that you would like on, the, on these ropes? How, how that's, are a these really ropes? Good, that's a really good question. Actually, I will hopefully get to that in the talk. I will be okay. talking about Fine. the dynamo Fine. that okay. produces this. This is an excellent question. But yes, uh, it's a big question where they come from. One way uh, for them to come about is to go from large scales to small scales. Um, so I, these magnetic fields can be dragged from, you know, uh, the galactic, galactic scales or a, a, if it is a binary system, an X-ray binary, a star overflows a Roche lobe and forms an accretion disk around the black hole and stellar magnetic field uh, can be dragged uh, to the black hole. Uh, but uh, what if there is no uh, strong magnetic field around the black hole? What if it's not large enough scale? These are open questions right now. Uh, and so we'll talk about one possibility where we can amplify the magnetic field in situ in the disk, which is pretty exciting. Thank you for the question, Nick. By the way, if you feel like uh, sharing your screen so I can read your appearance, like uh, are your faces like confused or, or happy, uh, feel free to do that. By all, by all means, you don't have to do this, uh, but you, you're welcome to if you, if you feel comfortable. Um, I, I think as, as uh, Maria said, it's best if you uh, deliver your talk uninterrupted and okay. then all questions will come. Sure, sounds good. Okay, cool. Uh, so what is a healthy jet diet? What do we need to feed the black hole with? Just like Nick is asking, uh, in order for it to produce powerful jets. In active galaxies, we think that only about 10% of galaxies actually are able to produce these jets. 90% don't. So what is it that determines whether the jet will be healthy? How do we feed the black hole to get such a jet? Uh, what sets the power of these jets? Because we give the black hole uh, gas, uh, m dot c squared is the energy that flows into the black hole. It it consumes the rest mass energy of the gas. And some fraction of it goes into the jets. Uh, so denote the jet power with P sub J. 
Uh, so what is the relationship between the two? What is the efficiency of jet production? What's the ratio of P jet over M dot C squared? Uh, how do jets collimate and become such, uh, uh, such uh, tightly collimated streams, you know, just a few degrees uh, in active galactic nuclei and in uh, gamma ray bursts? How do they accelerate? They presumably start uh, very slow near the black hole, but by the time they get out to really large distances, they can be moving uh, at Lorentz factors uh, or speeds uh, of you know, you know, 9, 99 uh, or high percent of the speed of light, or Lorentz factors of 10 for active galactic nuclei, uh, or for gamma ray bursts, we think maybe hundreds or even thousands. Uh, how do they get mass uh, on them? Because uh, uh, Observations suggest that uh, jets are heavy. Uh, they must have baryons in them. Uh, and uh, where did these baryons come from? Uh, finally, a big million dollar question is, how do the jets emit? Uh, what is the process that causes them to light up? And where does the energy for them to light up and for us to see them come from? Um, finally, uh, what I will argue later in the talk is that we do not expect uh, the uh, supply of the gas to be precisely lying in the equatorial plane of the black hole. What we would rather expect is that the supply of the gas will provide uh, a tilted accretion disk whose equatorial plane will be inclined at some random angle relative to the equatorial plane of the black hole. And when such a tilt exists, will they be even a jet at all? Uh, and if they will be, which way will it go? Will it go perpendicular to the uh, equatorial plane of the black hole, or will it be tilted and go perpendicular to the equatorial plane of the accretion disk? Um, and finally, why do some jets fall apart and the others uh, can uh, continue ever uh, happily ever after uh, and uh, deposit the energies very far away from the galaxies, whereas the other ones will disrupt inside the galaxies? So these are the sorts of uh, questions that I'm going to try and address. And I'm going to be focusing on active galactic nuclei because I know there is a lot of work done in the department uh, on this topic, but I'm happy to uh, shift around and uh, discuss applications in other contexts. So here is uh, my perhaps most favorite jet, the M87 jet, uh, which has exquisite data available. There is more recent data, but I'm going to focus on this uh, plot uh, that shows a series of images from 1994 to 1998. Um, uh, these are the optical images, I think, uh, and or maybe actually it's the radio. I, I keep forgetting. I think it's the op optical images from Hubble. And so you can see that uh, there are uh, pieces of jet. Uh, there are these uh, blobs uh, that are moving away from the center. Uh, and if you uh, draw a line through the positions of these blobs uh, in different years, you can see that the slopes of the lines are consistent. And that's telling you uh, that there is a well-defined speed to the jet motion. Uh, and the speed is of order of six times the speed of light. So this is a phenomenon known as superluminal motion. Of course, nothing is moving faster than the speed of light. But uh, the, um, the factor by which the speed exceeds the speed of light uh, on the sky is telling us about how fast the motion is. So in fact, this number gives us the lower limit to the Lorentz factor of the outflow, in this case, six. It means that we have direct evidence that there are blobs of things that are moving away from the center at these high Lorentz factors. So how does this acceleration happen? Uh, another puzzle uh, in uh, uh, the case of M87, and I see that there are chat messages, I think, op popping up. If there are questions, please voice them because it's hard for me to read uh, the, the questions, so feel free to do that. Um, another puzzle uh, in M87 is that if we plot the jet uh, cross-sectional radius along the vertical axis versus uh, the distance away uh, from the black hole on the jet, uh, we will find that uh, the jet maintains a parabolic shape for over five orders of magnitude uh, uh, along the jet. And this shape is given by z, the distance along the jet, is equal to uh, the cross-sectional radius r to the power 1.7. So it's basically uh, like a parabola, just with a different power law index, but it's a consistent parabola uh, from basically as 
deeply as we can image the black hole, uh, just around 10 gravitational radii deep projected, or in this case, this is 10 Schwarzschild radii, uh, going all the way out to 300,000 Schwarzschild radii. So how does this order uh, get established out of this turbulent accretion flow around the black hole? So that's, that's something that would be really good to, to understand if we're hoping to create a self-consistent model of a supermassive or stellar mass black hole accretion. So in order to explore this in a systematic way, I'm going to be uh, looking at this two-dimensional black hole playground. Uh, I'm going to be uh, plotting along the vertical axis uh, the thickness of the accretion flow uh, that is h over r. h is the thickness of the disk and r is the distance away from the black hole. So if h over r is of order unity, we will have a puffy disk uh, that is uh, as thick as uh, it's far away from the black hole. If h over r is much less than one, uh, like here, we will have a kind of a pancake disk, uh, which is very thin uh, compared to the distance. And uh, on the other axis, along the horizontal axis, I will be showing uh, the strength of the vertical magnetic flux. Uh, which I denote by the Greek letter phi, uh, subscript Z. Uh, so on the left over here, there will be weak uh, vertical magnetic flux, and on the right, there will be strong magnetic flux. So because the jets like the vertical magnetic field, because this is the one that the black hole eats, and then this is the one that the black hole can um, twist up into these magnetic springs or the jets, like we talked earlier, uh, this is the most easiest situation for the jets to occur. And I'm going to start uh, with this, and then I'm going to go and explore all the other ones. Because as we will see, although 90% of black holes don't seem to produce jets, um, actually all, all of these will produce the jets, uh, almost all of them. So we will be facing the problem of too many jets, at least in the numerical simulations. So uh, what happens here, so this is work by Kaushik Chatterjee, who just graduated from the University of Amsterdam and moving over uh, to Harvard once the pandemic subsides. And you can see that there is a, a nice, um, a nice uh, blue accretion disk around the black hole, and it produces a couple of jets, which are shown in red. And the biggest challenge nowadays is not to produce a jet, but to uh, follow this jet over many, many, many orders of magnitude. I mean, this scale separation that the simulation was able to accomplish looks impressive in the video, but just because our eye is very bad at making up orders of magnitude. Here, the simulation is just three orders of magnitude. Um, so we can easily make uh, from a combination of a black hole and Christian disk, a combination of jets and outflows that uh, uh, collimate these jets. But the challenge is not just to make the jets, it's to make the jets over five orders of magnitude so that we can connect the black hole uh, with the galaxy. That's really what we want. And uh, this is precisely what Koshik has done. Uh, he was able to uh, follow the jets uh, from um, the radius of the event horizon, so the horizontal axis, in case you cannot read the numbers, goes from one gravitational radius in log all the way out to over here to 10 to the 6 gravitational radii. Uh, and uh, the vertical axis in Lorentz factor, the bottom panel, goes from 1 to 10 gravitation, <laughs> 1 to 10 Lorentz factor is dimensionless, 1 to 10, also in log. And you can see that um, the observations shown here with the broken blue uh, lines agreeing with the simulations remarkably well. So this uh, magenta wiggly line is the simulations. But not only that, uh, we also find that the shape of the jet is following uh, the uh, observational data. You can see that uh, the blue dots are various observational points. And uh, the red line is the simulation. And both agree remarkably well, well over almost five orders of magnitude. So this is a really awesome achievement on the part of Kaushik uh, to carry out the longest range numerical simulations, which go all the way from the black hole to the edge of the sphere of influence, which is, uh, you know, 100,000 to a million times away from the black hole. Uh, and for this, we had to use a crazy resolution of, uh, you know, thousands of cells uh, in each dimension. So this is super, super awesome result. Um, 
And uh, one other thing for the experts is that the jets do reach matter domination at the end so that uh, the magnetization can drop below unity in case that's, that's interesting. It's important for acceleration of particles. Uh, I'm going to leave that to the question and answer session uh, towards the end if there is interest. Uh, so the other interesting thing is that we can actually make, look, make, a, <laughs> make a movie and take a look at it. And uh, what you see is the, all the standard, um, all the standard um, elements. You have an accretion disk over here, uh, and you have a pair of jets above and below the equatorial plane. The black hole is sitting right there. And you have these uh, uh, lowish density funnels, but they are still much more dense than the jet. The color here shows the density. So you can see red is high density and blue is low. And uh, this is all done on a logarithmic scale. So if we were to play this movie forward, you can see that there are instabilities at the interface between the jet and the wind. And if we zoom in, you will see that these instabilities are taking the gas from the heavy surrounding wind and mixing it into the jet. Excuse me, Sasa. Yeah, yeah. This is Antonius. Is this a two-dram? Because it's extremely stable. Uh, yes, it is a two-dimensional run. Yes, so far we can. Oh, this is a good, this is a good question. Did I say two-dimensional here? If I didn't say that, that's my bad. This is an axisymmetric run. That's true. Um, so far, we cannot do three-dimensional runs that extend all the way to these distances. Oh, yes, I did say axisymmetric. So it's one cell in the five direction. Yes. Um, yeah. So, but we are getting there. Uh, we get into three D uh, basically as we speak. Yeah. Thank you for the question. So you can see this mixing that's happening. Uh, this mixing may be affected, uh, to put out the caveat, by going to 3D. Uh, it might be suppressed because some of the energy will go from the two-dimensional mixing modes into three-dimensional wobbling modes, which might also uh, contribute to the mixing. But what's really exciting is that uh, we haven't seen that before until we went to really high resolutions. And so it's possible that once in 3D we go to high resolutions, we will see something that's very, very similar to this. And uh, the mass loading is so severe that it can actually kill the jet altogether and cause it to decelerate. Uh, so I don't, I don't have the plots right here, but uh, from Lorentz factor of you know, uh, six, it can go down to like two and couldn't go back up. So these sorts of instabilities at the jet interface might actually uh, be responsible for the slowdown uh, in the components uh, of the jets that have, have has been observed uh, in the radio observations. Uh, and thank you for the question, Antonius. Um, another, another question, yeah. what kind of instabilities is it? So this can is a really, what? yeah. Go ahead. No, no, I'm asking what type of instabilities, because the Kelvin Helmholtz can be several uh, magnetic, uh, 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 current uh, uh, driven stability. What, what, what kind of stability you have there? It's a really good question. So uh, I wish I had a straightforward answer. I don't think we have it. Uh, it's a really messy situation. It's not, uh, you know, slow growth of this instability that we actually can compare to, uh, to analytic models too easily. Uh, we think it's a combination of current driven uh, and Kelvin Helmholtz instabilities. Um, and uh, uh, it's possible that one instability gets this mode going and the other one then picks it up. Uh, there is also magnetic fields obviously involved, uh, even if it's Kelvin Helmholtz initially, and then these fields will be uh, reconnecting away due to the mixing. So there is a lot of, um, there's a lot of uh, physics going on here, but one thing that's clear is that there has to be some current driven instability that will jumpstart this process. Because these wiggles, uh, they have been predicted by Yuri Lebarsky, uh, like 10 years ago, and they have finally been seen. And once these wiggles develop, then probably Kelvin Helmholtz can take them and shear them because the jet is faster uh, than the outflow. And then reconnection kicks in and maybe heats up the jet. So that's both a way of mass loading the jet and also energizing uh, the electrons and the protons that are in the jet. Um, so I think it's a combination of things. If you have any ideas of how to approach and actually um, interrogate the simulation to figure out what is precisely going on with this wiggle, what sort of instability is driving it, or uh, maybe do it more on a statistical 
uh, scale, uh, use a statistical approach to figure out which instability dominates, I would really appreciate uh, any ideas. This is really challenging stuff, although this is a 2D simulation. Imagine what happens when we go to 3D. So perfect question. Thank you so much. Another similar yeah. question. How yeah. severe is the mass loading? Is it, uh, I mean, uh, in your simulations? I mean, how? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Could we, uh, this, uh, at, at some point, uh, destroy the jet? Yeah. Um, we haven't seen jet destruction, uh, per se, but we've seen jet slow down from Lorentz factor of around six all the way down to two. Uh, so uh, I imagine that if something is something that's relativistic, a jet becomes non-relativistic, we can call it a jet being destroyed. So in that sense, yes, uh, you know, this sort of instabilities can uh, slow down the jet to the point that we might call it a destroyed jet. And this can also be asymmetric. So one jet can, can be much more mass loaded than the other, and then that can flip around. So these instabilities is not something that is, um, launched uh, you know, or activated uh, consistently every time you run the simulation. Uh, you know, some small perturbations in the way magnetic fields uh, are you know, uh, amplified in the disk and being transported to the black hole and then producing these jets might affect um, how much mixing there is. Uh, so this is a, a nonlinear process. That's why I'm hesitant to make any bold claims and say that this is this or this is that. And this instability always happens. It seems to be sporadic. Uh, and uh, but it seems like the longer run we lo we're on the simulation, the worse it becomes. So it's possible that if we had infinite amount of time, like nature does, actually this will be even worse than what we have. Okay, thank you. Sure. Yeah, of course. Please keep them coming. Yeah, I I only have twenty slides, so actually I budgeted for a lot of questions because I know Maria asks a lot of excellent questions. So now I'm like my expectations are right there, like. <laughs> so feel free to ask. I'm not asking. I'm not asking so many questions during the colloquia, so I'm giving oh, them okay. to, the, no worries. to the audience. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, but uh, so, Sasha, yeah, if yeah. you prefer to have questions during the talk, so let's ask how this interface with <laughs> instabilities depend on distance, on the height uh, from the disk. Yeah, they... this is a really good question. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. That was also uh, one of my questions. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so these instabilities seem to be activated. We have been trying to figure out what is the uh, distance beyond which they get activated. And uh, we kind of convinced ourselves that they probably get activated outside of the fast surface. Um, but we're not entirely sure. It, uh, we, we even correlated them, like we plotted uh, the fast surface, we, we looked at the PSD, uh, the power spectral density of these oscillations, and it seemed like if we were to change the magnetization at the base of the jet, uh, then the fast surface moves around and these instabilities also move around. So it seems like there is a weak direct evidence that indeed these instabilities are coming, uh, you know, because uh, the flow has become uh, supersonic. Um, but we're not entirely sure, uh, and we don't have a very robust uh, argument for why that would be uh, the case. So you can see this vertical axis is, is around a thousand gravitational already and it's not a surprise that uh, it's not from that point of view that we uh, were showing you just things that are further out because uh, at smaller distances there is really no mass loading uh, and uh, the fast point happens uh, let's see at uh, I think around a few hundred so uh, just beyond a few hundred, then all of these instabilities start to kick in. Question, the, yeah. the red material, the, the dense material, did you put yes. in by hand in these simulations? Yes, we did. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. But yeah, um, the one thing that's important, we didn't do any tuning whatsoever. Uh, this was a torus, uh, the standard fish Bornman Crip torus uh, that we chose to be uh, starting at uh, near the black hole, let's say like 20 gravitational radii. And the outer distance we chose to be like 10 to the five, 10 to the six gravitation already to mimic uh, the transition to uh, the Bondi uh, sphere at around that distance. Uh, so we chose that, we didn't change that, and then we ran the simulation. So that's, that's what we've done. So uh, you can see that there is the red material, which is uh, the torus, 
there is uh, the wind that is slow that's separating the jet from the stores. And then there is a jet that's more columnated and becomes more and more collimated as it propagates further out. Cool. Thank you so much for the questions. Yeah, keep them coming. I, I think it's, it's nice. It's nice. It also helps me to wake up. I mean, maybe for you guys, also helps you to wake up. I'm still waking up. You, you're trying to fight the urge to go to sleep. Uh, yeah. Cool. Okay. okay if there are any questions. One. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you showed us previously that there is a nice agreement between the observations, the slope of the jet, and the yeah. simulations. Mm -hmm. So this comes automatically or you choose some kind of environment of, or something in order to so reproduce this slope? We didn't choose anything. Uh, we didn't tune anything specifically. So this came out automatically. So it's possible uh, that this is coming from the fact that these Fishbone Moncrief solutions just naturally produce uh, the sort of collimating profile. Uh, but it also is probably telling us about some very basic physics, which I'm embarrassed to say, I'm embarrassed to admit I don't have a very good understanding of why we have a power, except that uh, if we choose a big torus, it's scale free. Uh, therefore, there is no preferred distance uh, where there would be a break and a power law or something like this. So we would expect that a power law that's set up near the black hole will probably continue all the way out. So that's probably why we have a single continuous power law, like the basics of the physics. Um, analytically also, what we can see is that uh, if we ask, if we were to distribute magnetic flux in a, some sort of power law fashion and forget about the thickness of the disk, just attach it to uh, the equatorial plane, nail it, uh, then the power law index of how magnetic field scales with distance would translate into a power law index of the shape of the magnetic field lines. So there is a basically one-to-one -one mapping between what's happening along the equatorial plane and what's happening along the uh, jet axis. So I think that we've seen something just like that over here, except the precise slope, where it comes from, I have no clue. But what was stunning to us is without any tuning, just uh, picking uh, the boundary of the jet, uh, and plotting it uh, over the observational points, we find in stunning agreement, uh, which, which we just report. So I, I don't know how to explain why this is, why this is happening. Uh, and even more interesting is the fact that uh, the Lorentz factor, which uh, is whatever the system wants to, to pick, uh, even despite all these instabilities and so on, you see Lorentz factor sometimes goes up and it goes down and goes back up. Uh, it agrees remarkably well uh, with, uh, with the observed data, which is shown here as this power law um, in a blue line. Cool. Uh, yeah, please keep them coming. Uh, so what is it that we learned? If there is a lot of vertical flux, we have powerful jets, perhaps not so too surprising. Um, but as I said, 90% of the jets do not, uh, sorry, 90% black holes do not make jets. So what if we try and uh, consider this case? The disk will be still thick, but we will remove all of the vertical magnetic flux, and instead we will insert a toroidal magnetic flux. So it goes into the board and comes out from out of the board. Uh, that's the magnetic field geometry. So, uh, what you're going to be seeing here is this kind of series of uh, movies, which will look very uh, uh, analogous to each other. So this panel uh, is a, a box of 100 times 100 gravitational radii on the side, and it's a zoom in onto the central regions of the right panel, which is 1,000 times 1,000 gravitational radii on the side. And the color here uh, shows uh, logarithm of density. So red is very high, uh, logarithm is equal to two, and blue is very low, logarithm is equal to minus eight or so. And you can see our standard initial condition. So it's a torus that starts at around uh, 10 gravitational radii near the black hole, and it extends out to, you know, 100,000 gravitational radii. Uh, there is a peak of density somewhere around uh, uh, 15 or 20 or so gravitational radii. The black hole is sitting right here, uh, it's spinning at 99% uh, of the maximum spin. Uh, the vertical flux is not there. All the flux, as I said, is toroidal. And the disk is pretty thick, so the aspect ratio is one-third. So uh, let's run the simulation. What you're going to see is the emergence of black lines on this plot. 
these black lines show that the system, although it didn't have any flux in this plane, it developed this flux. So these are uh, flux surfaces um, in this vertical plane. So there is now a vertical magnetic flux, which is needed for jet formation. So the turbulence itself somehow manages to produce uh, the vertical flux that wasn't there. Uh, you can count up how many field lines or how many uh, units of flux was produced by just counting up the black lines. And you can see over time, especially on the right panel here, you can see that the sizes of these uh, poloidal flux loops, which were generated self consistently by the turbulent, turbulence, they're growing in size. So the magnetic flux becomes stronger and stronger over time. Once it reaches the black hole, um, you can see that there are many more flux surfaces in the jet than when we started the simulation. So it means that the field becomes stronger on the black hole. And uh, if we plot, uh, this is a pretty busy plot. I'm just going to ask you to focus on the second panel, which shows the ratio of jet power to accretion power. Uh, this is 100%, this is 200%. And you can see, apart from the gap in the data where the data was purged, the time average value of the jet power normalized by mass accretion rate is around 150%. So it means that the jet power actually, even in this very unfavorable situation when we did everything to kill the jets, we said no vertical flux, purely poloidal flux, which has never led in any previous simulation to a, a significant jet, actually causes a jet that's as powerful as possible. In fact, uh, the vertical magnetic field reaches equilibrium with the ramp pressure of the accretion flow or the magnetically arrested disk state uh, where the jet is as strong as possible and is of order of the accretion power. So this is an example, I think, answering uh, Nick's uh, question, how can we uh, get the magnetic field? And here is how we can at least convert the toroidal field component uh, into the vertical field component, if not generated uh, or amplified. So it's an ongoing work to try and understand uh, what sets the saturation of the vertical magnetic field um, uh, given the initial field strength in the toroid direction. And so what do we think was special about the simulations? Uh, we think it was a really high resolution uh, because uh, even though initially we only need to resolve the turbulence in the toroidal direction, the MRI in the toroidal direction, actually in order to get self-sustaining dynamo that produces this vertical magnetic flux, you have to resolve this really little very weak magnetic field that was just born in the vertical direction. So this is what we think we have done here. So this is a pretty unprecedented resolution here of 2,000 times about 600 times 1,000 cells. Um, this is one of the highest resolution simulations of thick disks. So um, too bad for us, good for the jets, bad for us. Uh, my goal at least was try to kill the jets and see how we can do that. However, if we do not include any vertical magnetic flux, the jets are still there, they're very healthy. So we're running out of options. How can we suppress jets? Well, perhaps one way to do so, to doing so, is to tilt the whole system. Uh, so we're going to add a third axis of disk tilt uh, right here. Um, and let's consider uh, this uh, case of a thick disk, but now tilted at an angle. Uh, this uh, tilt is actually expected in a wide range of systems. For instance, if we look at this uh, uh, image of X-ray and radio combined of this uh, cluster of galaxies MS7035.6, uh, we will see that there are huge cavities inflated by the activity of the central supermassive black hole, uh, where uh, you can see that there is purple, which is radio emission or synchrotron emission, uh, that is taking place uh, of uh, a hole in the blue emission, which shows the X-ray emission, the hot gas. So the hot gas actually was displaced by this relativistic plasma that was um, uh, produced by the activity of the black hole, probably in the form of a jet. Uh, and so there is a lot of work that needed to be done by the central black hole to, call, to give enough energy to this plasma to expand and do, do the PDV work to inflate these bubbles. And the, and the energy uh, that was needed to do this work is comparable to the entire rotational energy of the central black hole. So it's probably uh, the most dramatic example of uh, magnetic energy extraction from the black hole in action. But one thing that uh, could be striking here is lack of symmetries. So it's not like we're looking at something very orderly and symmetric. You know, in the equatorial plane, there is inflow, and uh, along the vertical axis, there is outflow. No, a uh, much more likely situation is when the inflow is tilted at some angle. 
uh, because the black hole is so small, the gas coming from large distances has no idea which way the rotational axis of the black hole is oriented, that the Christian disk has its own axis, which is misaligned with that of the black hole. And so you uh, generically end up with a sort of situation when the inflow is at an angle uh, uh, to the black hole equatorial plane, which will be always horizontal uh, in this sort of uh, movies. So what will happen? Will there be any jets or outflows? Will they point along the direction of black hole rotation axis or will they turn around and follow the rotational axis of the Christian disk? Uh, open question. Uh, so let's try and see if we can make progress. But before I show you some simulation results, I wanted to give you a little bit of a baseline of what we theoretically expect for a tilted disk dynamics to be. So suppose that uh, we take this accretion disk and we tilt it. Um, then, because this disk is feeling the frame dragging by the rotating black hole, uh, whose equatorial plane is horizontal, you see this is the rotational axis over here, uh, then the entire space-time rotates. So the accretion disk, uh, because it's immersed in the space-time, will be unwillingly participating in this sort of rotation of space-time. And so the entire disk will be precessing. So if you look in the slice, um, uh, the disk will be going like this, uh, but in a slice, uh, therefore, what will happen is uh, that the disk will be dancing around like that. Let me tuck my microphone so I don't pull on it. Um, so this is what we expect, precession, solid body precession of the disk. But this is only true for geometrically thick disks, so the ones that where thickness is comparable to the distance. What, however, happens if the accretion disk is thin? In this case, uh, the prediction that was made in, back in 1975 by Bardeen and Peterson and verified by simulations which didn't include uh, um, general relativity uh, and oftentimes didn't include magnetized uh, effects, the inner disk will flatten out in the equatorial plane of the black hole and then transition to the tilted disk at large distances. However, this has never been seen in the simulation that uh, was uh, accounting for general relativity. So what does it mean? Does it mean that this uh, effect of barton peterson alignment doesn't happen? Or does it mean that we just didn't uh, you know, go to thin enough accretion disk? And it's a really challenge to try and go to thin uh, accretion disks. That's because the cost to run the simulation scales as the aspect ratio of the disk, h over r, to the minus fifth power. So if I consider this that is twice as thin, I would have to run the simulation for 32 times longer, which obviously a time that I do not have. So what do I do? Do I wait for 32 years uh, or do I try and uh, uh, pull off a trick out of my hat? And so uh, we did a trick. Matthew Lischka, who graduated a, a year ago from University of Amsterdam, he's now a postdoc at Harvard, uh, he took our code, uh, harm or harm pi, and converted it to run on GPUs. So it's uh, really fast, uh, it runs really efficiently on GPUs. You can think of GPUs as an ant colony, uh, that where each ant is very, very wimpy, but together they can do great things. Um, or another analogy, uh, you know, of CPU versus GPU uh, comparison, um, you can think of uh, CPU is a Ferrari. It's a very powerful, uh, but it's just one, essentially. And so you want to move apartments. And, uh, you know, you can move apartments using a Ferrari, but probably it's not the most optimal way because you would have to make a lot of trips. Okay, they will be fast. Each of the trips will be very fast, but Ferrari won't fit too much, and you would have to go back and forth multiple times. Uh, that's the CPU. But the GPU is uh, a flock of horses. Ferrari has 400 horsepower. Well, let's replace a Ferrari with 400 horses. And provided we can break up the apartment into many little pieces that we can give to each horse, we can move the entire apartment in one go. And so this is what the GPU does. If you can break up your problem into little pieces to give uh, to each of the GPU threads, of which are almost 100,000 on the GPU, so tens of thousands. So if you can break up your problem into tens of thousands of little pieces which are independent of each other, or almost, uh, then your problem can be really good for GPUs. And that's precisely what we're dealing with. We're dealing with grids which have tens of thousands of cells. And that means that a per GPU, actually we have hundreds of thousands of cells, uh, if, not, uh, if not millions. So we can give uh, each GPU thread one cell to work with, and that actually turns out to work really well. 
So this code scales up to thousands of GPUs. Um, it, it's much faster one GPU than a single CPU core. Uh, most importantly, uh, Mac implemented advanced features into the code, such as adaptive meshes, both in space and time. You can see here, maybe, I don't know how good the quality of the video is, that uh, the mesh can refine uh, in the regions where there is gas. Uh, and that allows us to follow the, uh, the tilted disk wherever it goes. If it goes here or there, we don't know where it would go. We will just say, please refine in that region. And that allows us to speed up the simulations by orders of magnitude. So all of these speed ups, uh, you know, due to GPUs, adaptive meshes, allow us to, uh, um, to make use of GPU time very efficient, effectively. And because we're the only game in town, we get a lot of GPU computational time on the national resources. So we're operating uh, at the scale of millions of GPU hours a year, and that translates into billions of CPU hours effectively. If we, if we had access to CPUs instead of GPUs, this is how much time we would need to do the same sort of work. Billions of CPU hours, that's about a thousand times more than a typical allocation in the field. Uh, what I used to have before we started out on this GPU track, and that means that science is, in some sense, no longer limited by computational resources. We can do amazing science, a uh, thousand times more complex, complex computations uh, without waiting for 30 years. We can do it now. So here is an example of a tilted disk uh, with an aspect ratio of about one-tenth, uh, tilted by 45 degrees relative to the uh, quaternal plane of black hole. You can see the disk over here uh, in blue. And there are a couple of red jets that this disk produces. So let's see. Uh, how this works. You can see that the disk is actually precessing, uh, just as we expected theoretically, and it's taking the jets with it. So it means that if we can observe precessing motions at large scales, where we actually can resolve the jets, uh, that they can inform us of the general relativistic uh, frame dragging effect and interactions between the accretion flow and the curved space time of the black hole, uh, which is spectacular. Uh, so this is a really big deal. It means that if observers do see these precession motions, it means that uh, they actually might have come from tilted accretion flows. So, so far, again, we haven't fared too well. Uh, even when we tilted the disk, it still produced jets. So what happens if we try and look at a thin disk, still with a lot of vertical magnetic flux? Thin disks are expected to be unable, it is theoretically expected to be unable to hold onto the magnetic flux. It's like a thin sheet of paper that's really easy to tear through. That's uh, the analogy. A thick disk is like a book, and a thin disk is like one sheet of paper. It's much easier to cut through uh, the sheet of paper instead of the book. Very flawed analogy, but kind of gives you an intuitive picture for why we would expect that the thin disk won't be able to hold onto the, all of these vertical magnetic field lines. So if the disk were to lose these lines, then the jet power would drop. And finally, we would have a jetless black hole. So let's take a look at what's happening here. We're also going to be on the lookout for Biden-Peterson effect uh, for the alignment in the equatorial plane. We didn't see that in a thicker disk. What uh, shall we see in a disk that is three times as thin? So the previous disk was um, of thickness h over r 0.1. This one is three times as thin 0 0.03, 1 over 30. The disk is still tilted by 45 degrees. So the only difference between this simulation and the previous one uh, is that uh, the disk is three times as thin. The left panel is a zoom in on the central regions of the right panel. Uh, and this is about 30 gravitational radii on the side on the left. And this is about 160 gravitational radii on the side on the right. So let's run the simulation and see what happens. You see the disk is initially tilted by 45 degrees. It's doing of uh, this uh, flapping motion like we expected due to the precession. But wait, 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 this is an amazing thing going on here. The inner part of the Christian disk uh, is actually aligned with the equatorial plane of the black hole. And not only that, because the alignment is happening so abruptly, uh, there is a, a discontinuity almost between the aligned part of, misaligned part of the disk and the aligned part in the small regions. So this is the first demonstration of barton peterson alignment in the general relativistic magnetized simulation. Uh, and it also demonstrates that it can be accompanied by these sharp breaks uh, between the inner parts and the outer parts. Right now, we see that the disk has processed to the point where in the vertical slice, it looks horizontal. It, it's not really aligned. It's just uh, going, it's just a phase of precession. Now you see it processed such that it's tilted the other way. Uh, there are interesting things. Apparently, magnetic flux might be leaking from the central black hole. 
Uh, we haven't yet gotten to be looking at that. This could be really exciting. This could be an example of a thin mad uh, naturally developing in a tilted disk. And you can see the remarkable thinness of the accretion flow. Uh, and also you can see an effect that we're gonna be talking about, disk tearing, uh, which is bringing me to the next slide. So this is disk tearing. Uh, it happens much more readily when we tilt the disk by even higher angles, 65 degrees as opposed to 45 degrees. And in 3D, it looks like this. Uh, we have a disk uh, on large scales, but the disk on small scales tore off of the outer disk. Why would that happen? Well, because the black hole applies the lens steering precession torques at small distances. Uh, that's where all of these uh, precession forces are the strongest, the frame dragon forces are the strongest. And so the disc can only sustain this torque and transport it outwards so that the entire disc recesses as a hull uh, only until a certain breaking point. And once it breaks or tears, uh, we will now get two discs. So let us look at it in a three-dimensional movie. So initially the disc is tilted and it's planar and it produces jets that are perpendicular to it. But then see, uh, the inner disc has torn off from the outer disc and uh, it's taking the jets with it to the point that eventually the jets slam into the outer disk and completely wipe it out. Imagine what sort of observational fireworks this must accompany in high energies and across the spectrum. The disk continues tearing like a Matryoshka doll uh, hierarchically to smaller and smaller scales. Now we have seen three disks and the remnant of the original fourth disk. The inner disk eventually aligns in the equatorial plane of the black hole, and the jets are just doing their best to survive. They're trying to find their way uh, of least resistance uh, outwards. There are some spectacular things like disks can merge uh, and kind of uh, reconnect with each other, like, like now, and then they will try to separate again. And so for a while, you might not be able to see through them, at least in this video rendering. Uh, so we would have seen the central black hole if it were not for this warp disk. And then eventually, boom, we can start seeing through the disk. So you can also imagine that we can expect time variability in a, some, some sort of periodic fashion uh, coming from the central regions, both in the jets and in the accretion disks. Uh, finally, the outer disk can completely block the inner region on its own. So there are several types of variability with several frequencies that are possible at the same time. Each disk can contribute its own variability. Perhaps this might have something to do with quasi-periodic oscillations from black holes, uh, but this is still a preliminary stage of work. We would like to make a firmer connection. So we have failed again. The jets have won again. Uh, in this case of a tilted thin disk, uh, the jets are produced just fine. So what is left for us to do? Perhaps one of these two options uh, might be what we're looking for, finally, uh, something that will shut up the jets. And although I say it's future work, we are now in the future. Uh, so let's actually take a look at this bottom left panel where I'm going to show you some uh, rather exciting uh, recent results. So this is uh, uh, the, th uh, the first simulation of a thin disk that doesn't have vertical magnetic field. So the entirety of the field is sitting inside of this thin disk. And there are two panels over here. There is a left panel that will show a 3D rendering of the disk, and there is a right panel that will show vertical slice to give you two different perspectives. Uh, the disk is very similar otherwise to what you just saw, except that uh, its thickness is slightly smaller uh, by 50%, so it's 0 0.02 instead of 0 0.03, and this magnetic field geometry difference is the biggest deal. So its magnetic flux is entirely uh, toroidal, uh, of course, tilted together with the disk. This is a, an insane simulation. Uh, it's the most expensive, uh, general relativistic magnetized simulation ever. Uh, it's possible that the cost of the simulation uh, is uh, larger than the sum of all of the GR MHD simulations that have ever been performed and published in, the, in our field. Um, it's, uh, it was 5 million GPU hours, or if you multiply by, you know, uh, a thousand, uh, the effective cost if we were to run the same thing on CPUs uh, it would be 5 billion or so. I mean, it's, it's an insane number of CPU hours. Of course, it's, it's kind of a um, elusive number because it's not real. Uh, it's just a conversion factor uh, to CPU hours, but it just gives you, it just uh, goes to show how expensive this would have been on the CPU. Uh, so the effective resolution inside the disk is about uh, 14,000 times 5,000 times 8,000 cells, which is 
about a factor of 10 times 10 times 10 higher than the typical, uh, or I would say state of the art in our field right now. So we're beating the state of the art by a factor of a thousand and resolution elements. That's completely crazy. So let's run the simulation and see what happens. So first of all, you see that the frame dragon will cause a warp in the disk. The disk tries to resist uh, tearing, but it can't. And uh, the inner part of the disk still managed to tear off. You see, uh, it's happening rather periodically. It's the second tear that we've already seen uh, in the simulation. Uh, and this tearing will keep happening rather regularly. In terms of looking for the jets, you will see that there are no jets over here. And that's pretty spectacular. It means that we have finally accomplished our goal. We found a setup, a uh, physical setup, where uh, that doesn't lead to the production of uh, large scale jets. And what's also really cool is that all of these different effects like tearing that we've seen right now and the inner parts eventually will align uh, with the black hole equatorial plane. There is alignment happening over here. It might be a little bit hard to see given the zoom's resolution. So you might want to switch over to uh, the screen sharing if you want to get a better resolution. But now you can actually see that the inner disk, uh, although torn from the outer disk, uh, is uh, developing the line portion. It gets consumed by the black hole and then uh, tearing happens again. Actually, I think the simulation will, the end of the simulation will happen first, uh, but I can replay it again if interested. Ah, there's still more tearing happening. So the simulations show that uh, tearing is independent of the field geometry. Uh, this uh, phenomenon is very robust. It happens for both vertical field and toroidal field. Uh, and uh, it happens in very, very thin disks. So we went down to even thinner disks. Uh, and you see again, uh, alignment of the inner regions. Um, you can also see that these sort of torn disks are not the standard ones. You can have several uh, mid planes at the same distance. And so these disks can kind of run into each other. You can think of these concentric rings that are kind of rubbing against each other. So there could be uh, really, really cool things. Like right now, the simulation stopped in the process of tearing. Uh, so you can have one, two, three disks happening at the same time. Uh, so this is really, really awesome. And so uh, finally, I don't know how much time I have. I can wrap it up here. I can talk about interactions with ambient medium. So please tell me because I think I'm out of time basically here, am I? Uh, I think we have definitely five minutes um, and then we can switch to questions because cool. we have already asked several of them. So Cool, please. okay, okay, sounds good. Yeah, so, um, so all of that was happening on small scales. So all of this was happening on a small scale. Let's see if I can make it play again. Um, uh, all this tearing and so on, but all the jets and outflows that this simulation doesn't produce, by the way, but for all the other simulations, all of the jets and outflows will run into the ambient medium where we will be observing the fireworks for a long time. So what is it that we are seeing observationally? Can that help us to diagnose what's happening in the inner regions of the accretion disk? Um, and let's take a look at uh, the images on largest scales of the jets. These are two of my favorite jets. Uh, this is uh, a, a Cygnus A jet, and this is an M87 jet. Uh, let me get out of the way. And you can immediately see that although the central black holes are very similar, they're about 10 billion solar masses in, um, in, in size, um, there are very different geometries of the jets. This one is very collimated, ends up in a hot spot, and has strong backflows. Whereas this one, oh, well, first of all, we only see one jet. That's because this is the one that's pointing towards us, and uh, it's the one whose emission is beamed towards us relativistically. There is another jet, we think, and we just see the effect of the jet on the ambient medium over here, similar to what we see in over there. But you can see the one that we see is much less stable. It looks like it's fallen apart before actually falling apart and ending up in the swoosh. And you can see that the swoosh is actually, or the jet exhaust actually outruns the jet uh, as opposed to going back over here. This difference is known as Fanner of Brady type one, type two dichotomy, uh, with the difference being powerful jets making it out of the galaxies and most of the emission happening at large distances, whereas wimpier jets, uh, they can be disrupted within the galaxies uh, and uh, they kind of lit up uniformly. That's the observational. Uh, distinction. So you can see that the Cygnus A jet is about 10 to the 46 ergs per second, and M87 jet is around 10 to the 44 ergs per second. So a factor of 100, but what a difference does it make for morphology? So 
for physics. We're really interested in understanding what makes the jet stop inside the galaxy and therefore deposit all of its energy inside the galaxy as opposed to just punching a hole and depositing all the energy out where nobody cares about it. You know, it's, it's out of the galaxy. So what is it that allows the jets to do the feedback, as we say, on the galaxy? Uh, so this is the puzzle. Uh, what causes, what's the physics behind this finite of Frehley uh, dichotomy of IGN? And uh, one possibility is perhaps this is a magnetic field, magnetic instability. Um, so how would magnetic instability work? Well, remember these jets are magnetic springs. Uh, and uh, if, if let's say this is a jet and I squeeze it like that, so there is more jet coming from the black hole because it winds up the field lines and produces more uh, segments of the magnetic spring that, that keep coming. Uh, and there is ambient medium. So it's a spring that's squished. And if we take a spring and squish it, it will try to fly sideways. You know, I used to disassemble these automatic pens and squeeze them and then they will fly sideways um, to the annoyance of my parents. So this is what we think nature is doing. They're playing with these magnetic springs and when the springs kink sideways, uh, it means the jets disrupt. And so uh, the weaker the spring, the easier it is for it to disrupt and so weaker jets can fall apart. So let me show a rather old simulations over here with a new uh, upgrade in a sec. So the top uh, will be the movie of a jet that's 100 times more powerful than the bottom. And so the top movie is meant to represent the, the strong type two jet and the bottom movie is meant to represent a weak type one jet. And uh, the circles, both of them show 10 kiloparsec uh, sphere. Uh, so this circle is small on that because we're zooming in on the bottom. Uh, you will see that will be useful. So I will press play and uh, we will start seeing uh, the evolution of the uh, top jet over here. You can see it's going pretty fast. Um, and uh, you can see that although it's wobbling left and right, uh, oops, it's wobbling left and right, uh, it is mostly remaining stable. It's not really falling apart or anything. So this is uh, uh, like a bendable drill that you try to put into the wall. And uh, uh, it kind of wobbles around but doesn't break. You can see that the exhaust of the jet actually flows back really nicely, which uh, is a good uh, agreement with the observations. Um, you can also see that there are large scale bends of the jet, which may be uh, comparable to those seen uh, in this um, jet. You can see in the contrast that the other jet uh, is struggling to make it out. It's basically stuck. Uh, in this uh, kind of permanent state of despair. Uh, and the longer and longer we wait, it will propagate, but you will not be really noticing its propagation because uh, right around five kiloparsec, it almost hits a brick wall. Uh, it ties itself into knots uh, and uh, just feels miserable. Uh, inflates cavities. So uh, I'll, I'll let it play for a few seconds for you to see that. So what is happening there? We think that this sort of jet tying itself into knots is a manifestation of the magnetic kink instability as I pre-announced. Uh, and uh, the distance at which this happens is actually comparable to uh, the distance at which this jet is falling apart, the M87 jet. So here we use a simplified uh, way of initiating these jets. We took a sphere and we spun it. So the, you can see the radius of the sphere right here. That's the gap in the jet. Uh, so the scale separation here is actually just, you know, maybe a couple of orders of magnitude. Um, and there is no accretion flow here. We just took a magnetized sphere, sphere and spun it. Uh, but it does look remarkably similar to the observations. So uh, we can now do better. Uh, we can now include an accretion disk, uh, which produces jets. And if we put in dense enough ambient medium, we will see that the jet can kink. Uh, due to this magnetic instability, and then inflate a bubble that buoyantly arises. So this is the new kind of uh, generation of this sort of approach where we can actually follow the jets from the black hole where they're self-consistently produced by the accretion material, uh, run out, uh, slam into the ambient medium, disrupt, and uh, uh, inject energy into this cavity. So now we can maybe start comparing uh, the statistical properties of uh, these cavities to those observed and seeing uh, if we can extract more data 
from the observations. So that's, uh, that's actually it. I will skip through that and uh, come to my summary. Jets are extremely resilient. Uh, whatever you throw at the black hole, provided that it has large scale magnetic field component, it doesn't matter which way, uh, azimuthal or vertical, uh, jets will be produced. Um, we now start to understand acceleration, dissipation, mass loading, and disruption of the jets, uh, all in one single simulation. Uh, we can now include the tilt of the Christian disk relative to the black hole, and the tilt brings about a whole plethora of new exciting effects, such as uh, the alignment and breaking of the Christian disks, including and including tearing of the Christian disks, with amazing interactions between jets and tilted disks where the jets can disrupt uh, and completely destroy parts of accretion disks. Thank you so much for your attention. I hope I'm not too much over time and please ask me any questions you like. Great, thank you so much for the interactive talk. First of all, it is one of the first ones. <laughs> I'm happy to be. So, um, yeah, I think it was a very nice experiment. Actually, it worked pretty nicely. Uh, to be able to walk around and I so, hope it came yeah, through like well. I hope you can read the text. Talk. Can you read the text that that's shown on the slides? Not not behind you, but on the screen. Uh -huh. We got to switch <laughs> back and forth. Good. No, not behind excellent. you, but we see the screen. Good, excellent. It was excellent. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. Can I have uh, one minute, please? Yes, yes. Okay, of um, uh, Sasha. Uh, I bet. Uh, that you are graded as A plus professor at the university. <laughs> they better, they better do me. They better do me a good grade. Yes. Okay. Good. Uh, very exciting talk. I um, I have a comment and a question. Yeah. The, the comment is that AGN jets are very exotic, and this is why uh, many people uh, study them. Uh, ah. On the other hand, they have a time scale of. Yeah. Uh, much longer than the life uh, than the human lifetime. Yes. Uh, on the other hand, their little brothers, the uh, uh, black, the, the binary black hole uh, jets, um, mm -hmm. have time scales of hours. Mm -hmm. So the question is the following: We see the following. Uh, this is an observational fact mm -hmm. for one particular source called GX three three nine minus four. We see. The, the source, the, the source, the jet disappearing mm -hmm. and reappearing in an hour and disappearing mm -hmm. in another hour and reappearing and so on. So I, I cannot see how the source anticipates that it will need magnetic field to eject the jet so that it can call the companion and say, hey, friend, send me some magnetic field. I need it. Uh, I will need it, in fact, uh, tomorrow at 12. Uh, that cannot happen. So I have the feeling that it is produced locally, but uh, I don't know what your feeling is. And that's my question. What about local production of magnetic fields? So that is an awesome question. Um, so I honestly was stunned when we saw the production of this large scale flux that just kept growing and growing in the same sense. Um, and what we found is when we switch to a smaller scale disk, not this infinite big disk like we think maybe an AGN might have at low luminosities, but a smaller disk. Like in black hole binaries, we have a thin-ish disk at large scales, we think, because Coulomb, Coulomb collisions and the cooling is efficient. And then uh, Coulomb collisions become inefficient in small scales and the disk puffs up in small regions. Um, so then we have a more limited range that the, th that the disk can span. And so what we think might be happening is this, in fact, we ran a simulation with toroidal field in the context of binary mergers, uh, where the primary difference was uh, that the disk was smaller in scale. And what we found was that there were a few flips uh, in the orientation of the magnetic field lines in the jet. Um, and uh, it's quite possible that these limited scale disks will have dynamo that only gets activated at the outer edge of the inner thick disk. So there is a time scale, the dynamo time scale that's associated with the distance uh, on which the magnetic field can flip orientation because whether it points up or points down is a random process. And so if that indeed happens, 
then perhaps this one hour time scale, it's a really long time scale by a black hole binary standards, right? Uh, it's, a, you know, tens of microseconds uh, is, the, is the time scale to, to light, for light to cross the black hole. It's a dynamical time scale. It's really small. And you're talking about hours, uh, you know, an hour, which is a thousand seconds. So we go from, you know, 10 to the minus five seconds to 10 to the three seconds. It's eight orders of magnitude in dynamical, you know, um, resolution between those uh, different times. So this has to be a large scale process that's happening at large distances, uh, but perhaps not on the scale of the companion star because that would be too large of a time scale. So perhaps uh, this might be, you know, this could be good exercise to try and work out what the dynamo time scale is, what sort of outer age of the inner disk could be, and maybe this has to do something, uh, maybe this has something to do with the time scale that you're wondering about. This is a really good question. I would love to talk to you more about it. Okay, thank you. Okay, let me uh, ask uh, two questions that were basically written in the chat room. Uh, Marcos uh, Polkas says, a great speech, first of all, with an exclamation mark. Thank you. <laughs> How radiation is treated in the simulations shown in the last slides? <laughs> and what scale are the bubbles rising from the instabilities? Uh, so, in, in this slide, you mean, right? Um, I suppose so, yes, in the last slides where yeah. you were talking about the propagation. So, uh, no radiation whatsoever. This is completely non-radiative. Uh, this was proof of principle simulation where I insert a magnet into a, a, a power low density distribution, no gravity, uh, and uh, uh, no um, no radiation. Uh, what else? Uh, no initially thermal energy. So it's basically called uh, spherical distribution of gas into which we insert a spinning magnet. Uh, and you can see that this very simple setup. Uh, it allows us to understand things analytically. We actually can write down the stability criterion and so on, which I skipped over, but I'm happy to talk about this offline, uh, and leads to this really rich type of interaction. In these simulations over here, we still don't have any radiation, but uh, now we include uh, the accretion flow and so on. Uh, having said that, we just implemented the, uh, the radiation treatment under the code. So we will be able to include radiation to simulate thin accretion disks, for instance. Um, Radiation in the jets is, is more complicated uh, because as many of you work on that, um, uh, the uh, physics there is non-thermal. Uh, particles are, are accelerated. Uh, there is a distribution function. It's not a fluid, it's collision-less. Uh, so it's difficult to include that sort of uh, physics uh, in the fluid form in the simulations. Um, however, this can be done through subgrid models or perhaps in the future when we include a, a Monte Carlo uh, approach to uh, to radiation and perhaps include some of the relativistic particles uh, on the grid, uh, modelless particles bouncing around. So that's definitely something that we'd be very interested in uh, talking to uh, any and all of you. Uh, so let me know if you have any thoughts of uh, where this can be applied or maybe how this can be done um, in a technical level, although uh, we have some ideas. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Sasha. Uh, there are also two more questions in the chat room if you're still not very tired. Oh, no, 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 <laughs> so, no, no. I'm, I'm super excited. It's, it's still, it's still lunchtime okay. for me. Yes. <laughs> okay. So Dimitris Milas uh, says, again, impressive simulations, exclamation mark, and a couple of questions. First of all, relevant to the instabilities. What is the mm -hmm. density and magnetization ratio between the jet and the wind? Mm -hmm. And second, are instabilities triggered in all cases or are they quenched for specific scenarios? Uh, yeah, uh, great question. Let's see if I can go back to that specific run. So that was uh, at the very beginning. Yeah, here. Uh, actually, it's the first time me doing PowerPoint because uh, I'm doing this on my workstation and uh, it's a Windows computer because we're doing, um, uh, we're using GPUs. And so they're much better work uh, at, uh, on Windows. Uh, so I apologize for the quirks. Uh, yeah, so uh, this blue region is uh, um, magnetization of around uh, 5 to 10, uh, depending on the simulation. Uh, this sort of mixing happens uh, in essentially all cases. Uh, and you can see the, uh, and the magnetic fields are rather comparable in terms of their strength uh, because magnetic pressure roughly in, is roughly in balance. You can see blue to green. Uh, 
I mean, actually doesn't tell you. But typically, uh, the contrast here, this will be sigma of maybe around 1, and this may be sigma of around 10. So the contrast is about a factor of 10 in magnetization, if that's what you're, you're wondering about. Uh, this mixing uh, tends to happen uh, rather, rather naturally, as long as our resolution is high enough. Uh, again, the, uh, the caveat is that it's in two dimensions. In 3D, this might uh, happen at a lower efficiency. Um, I think this is all I can tell you right now of what I'm confident about. Uh, but this basically is a random process uh, that always kicks in at a certain point, at least in the two-dimensional simulation that we run. And also, this is when uh, there is a large-scale distribution of gas uh, and, uh, um, and outflows. So if the jets, for instance, uh, break out of the galaxy uh, or break out of the ejector in binary merger or in, uh, in the context of uh, X-ray binary, uh, the jets will no longer feel the ambient uh, uh, density because ambient density moves slowly and the jets are relativistic. So they will be basically expanding uh, freely. So uh, this process uh, might not be there at all uh, if the jets get out of the confining medium before this process can get activated. And so far, we found it was activated around uh, you know, three orders of magnitude away from the black hole. OK, thank you. Uh, one more from the chat room. And then if somebody else has questions, uh, they can raise their hands. Uh, from Professor Lucas Vlachos, great talk. And what happened on the dissipation of magnetic fields on scale below the resolution of the code and possibly accelerate particles? Uh, awesome question. This is basically where you are hitting at the limitations of our approach. Um, when uh, there are two magnetic field lines that are coming together, and uh, as long as they're separated by more than maybe like, let's say, a few cells, uh, you know, the code will keep them happily separated. But if they are forced uh, to come to within uh, maybe a couple of cells, three cells, four cells, whatever the um, smallest length scale that our code can resolve, uh, then they will reconnect. Uh, they basically annihilate. Uh, magnetic energy will be destroyed. But because the code is total energy conserving, uh, that energy will go into the internal energy uh, or the kinetic energy. If uh, you know this uh, thermal energy pushes uh, the gas, then it can accelerate. Uh, the bulk velocity will be increased. Um, so we don't really have non-thermal particles in the code. That's something that would be interesting to take into account in the future. Um, this hasn't happened yet, primarily due to the reason that there is no uh, kind of full-blown model that tells you, OK, for this sort of free connecting geometry, this is what is the distribution function of relativistic particles you need to put in. Uh, this still is not uh, fully settled. Um, but in the future, it would be really interesting to try and uh, populate non-thermal particles, uh, and this actually has been done in some simplified approaches already, especially in the context of uh, Christian and the Galactic Center and M87, where there's a lot of uh, exciting uh, event horizon telescope work and lots of Chandra observations <coughs> and uh, high energy observations. So um, uh, people are already working in that direction. So one can include non-thermal particles in various approximations and try and figure out uh, what sort of um, uh, spectrum, uh, non-thermal spectrum these particles will produce. Uh, we haven't been uh, working on this actively, primarily because of the uncertainty in the underlying uh, acceleration models. Uh, but uh, once the models firm up, I think it will be a good idea to try and put that in uh, and see how to make connections better. Or if there is a very strong uh, case uh, coming from observations uh, or from particle acceleration physics, where it would be really interesting to try a few models and see, do they match the observations? So um, I would be happy to talk to any of you who has any suggestions. Thank you once again. So are there any other questions? Yes, Professor Kanaris Tsinganos. Yes, um, um, thank you, Sasha, for this great talk. I have a simple question. Um, the these jets uh, presumably go down to the magnetosphere of the black hole and they're related to uh, everything that you have shown to the angular momentum of the uh, black hole. Uh, or to reverse the question, uh, uh, we can uh, determine from the appearance of the jet the angular momentum of the black hole. So I yeah. wonder what kind, I, I mean, 
you have shown to us uh, general relativistic uh, MHD simulations, uh, which uh, from a from a Kerr black hole, right? Uh, correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what uh, uh, what's the angular momentum? But I'm, I mean. Did, did you have the angular momentum of a black hole as a parameter? How did you choose the angular momentum? What is the dependence of the angular mo of the of the appearance of the jet on the angular momentum of the of the black hole? And there is also other questions related to the connection of the jet uh, to the black hole. Namely, there should be some stagnation point there because some some material from the disk will go in, some uh, will go out. I don't know, uh, I, w I was wondering in this uh, nice simulations if you have taken into account uh, these um, uh, details, uh, let's uh, call them. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for the question. Um, uh, so um, we include most of these effects. So uh, let me try and break down your question into parts and apologies if I missed something, so please remind me. So one question was, uh, do, how, how do we choose the spin of the black hole, uh, which sets the ergosphere? Uh, yeah. Well, uh, we typically choose it in the range between 0.9 and 0.99. We are interested in the strongest effects of frame dragging uh, that will be launching the jets or causing the disk to process or align or tear, all those sorts of good things. Uh, and uh, uh, typically we pick something like 0 0.93, 0 0.94. That's because it's high enough uh, to cause really dramatic effects uh, of interest, and it's still not too close to one uh, maximum value of the dimensional spin, uh, at which point the numerical simulation becomes prohib prohibitively expensive because you need to numerically resolve the distance between the inner and outer horizon, which kind of shrink on onto each other. Uh, and so, you know, 0 0.95, 0 0.93, 4, something like this is a, is a good sweet spot that, that balances those competing priorities. Um, so that's a choice, but we've tried to run these simulations at other spins as well. We spot check to see what sort of effect it has um, on jet power specifically and also on tilted disks. So we, we, we can, I can talk about that too if you're interested. Um, in terms of the stagnation point, yes, we include the stagnation point into the simulations. Uh, you, if, we, if one plots streamlines in time average sense uh, of where the gas goes, you know, some gas will go into the black hole. Like here, the gas will go into the black hole at small distances. Let me run the simulation. Uh, and will go out at large distances. So there is always a, a characteristic radial scale inside of which the gravity wins and outside of which uh, the uh, you know, centrifugal forces, magnetic forces, uh, and thermal forces are able to push the gas out. Uh, that uh, uh, radius depends on the strength of the magnetic field, so how much vertical magnetic flux we put in, and of course on the spin of the black hole and on the sign of the spin of the black hole. So if the black hole spins in the same sense, if it's prograde, uh, same sense as the disk, uh, or in the opposite sense, uh, the strength of the outflow will be, will be different. If the black hole spins in the opposite sense, um, the, it will be robbing the disk gas of the angular momentum. It will be easier for the gas to fall in. Uh, if the magnetic fields are stronger, then it will be easier for these uh, magnetic field to launch the outflows and deprive the gas, the accretion disk of the gas. Um, so the position of the surface moves around. There's also a surface like this in the jets, which uh, it's, it's probably somewhere around over here. It actually formally, uh, it, it opens up to infinity at the axis because there are no forces uh, that push out because there's one single lonely field line along the polar axis and there's gravity acting in. So the flow is always, you know, if we had infinite resolution, it would always fall in. Then if you step away a little bit, uh, so the surface kind of blows up to infinity and then goes in and, and kind of hugs, the, crosses the disk over here, something like that. So like, let's see, well, I will show it here, like that. Uh, so this kind of curtain-like shape. Uh, so everything inside the jet will be dominated by gravity and it will fall, outside it will flow out, and somewhere around this region, uh, there has to be a process that mass loads the jet. Uh, otherwise, it will be completely hollow. Uh, uh, there would be no charges left in the jets. So what exactly the process is, is unclear. Uh, in our simulations, we set a density floor. And uh, so we basically say that the density cannot drop below a certain fraction of magnetic energy. So rho c squared cannot drop below, let's say, uh, b squared over 100 or something like this. Uh, and so this 100 basically tells us what's the maximum Lorentz factor the jets can, uh, can reach. 
um, theoretically, if all magnetic energy would go into kinetic energy. That's our parameterization of magnetization of the jets. Plus, on top of that, of course, there will be mixing that we discussed. You can see mixing here happening in three-dimensional simulation as well. Uh, so this can mass load the jets. Uh, did I miss any parts of your question? Uh, I apologize. Well, no, that, that, that's fine. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much for the question. So there are two more questions. Yeah. Uh, one is from George Vasilopoulos. <laughs> oh, hi, Sasha. Hi, hi, George. Thank you for the great talk. So I have My a follow-up question about the observer, observational signatures in galactic X-ray binaries. Yeah. I understand that all this disk breaking and the flitting and the rings would essentially obscure the central source and yeah. change the orientation. So, mm -hmm. what is the time scale for this effect, uh, like a full rotation of the ring, perhaps for a 10 solar mass uh, black hole? And uh, what I understand is this, apart from the QPOs you mentioned, this could yeah. also cause some rapid, rapid absorption incidents in X-rays, or even affect uh, all this modeling that has been done for iron line reflection, which is used to, uh, you know, derive properties for the black hole spin, geometry of the inner disk. And if it's all this variable on short time scales, it makes totally. me wonderful. Yeah, I fully agree that the, I mean, this is why it's so exciting is uh, not only do we have extra dissipation, we can also have this uh, uh, time dependent obscuration of effects on the iron line, like you say, all of this good stuff. Uh, so the time scale is determined basically by the spin of the black hole and the size of the accretion disk. Um, so there is a torque. Uh, that the uh, black hole applies on the inner part of the disk, the lens steering torque. And, uh, uh, you know, then the angular momentum of the, of the disk will start changing in time uh, according to dl dt is equal to the torque. Uh, so if angular momentum is big, so if the disk is large in scale, then uh, uh, dl dt will be still the same and dl dt will be pointing perpendicular to the vector so it will be causing the vector to process so dl dt will be smaller compared to l um, if l is huge because dl dt is fixed uh, by the lens steering torques so this is a long and convoluted way of saying that if the disk is big it contains a lot of angular momentum and it will be harder for that for the black hole to cause that angular momentum all of it to process uh, okay, it's kind of disk versus black hole fight over here. Um, so uh, you can see here that the time scales for precession, uh, the time scale for the simulation is around 100,000 dynamical times of the black hole. And you can see that some disks have processed many times. Some of them have processed only once, like this, uh, this outer disk. Uh, so you can have a full range between the time scale of uh, around 100,000 times the light processing time of the black hole. So in the case of uh, an X-ray binary, if the light crossing time of the black hole is, let's say, 30 mi microseconds, uh, so let's just say it's a few times since the minus five, uh, it will be uh, basically a few seconds will be uh, the time scale, uh, the longest time scale uh, that the simulation will cover. And the shortest time scale will be about maybe 10 times uh, long, sorry, 10 times shorter, so maybe 0.1 second. So we're looking in the time scales uh, in the black hole binaries uh, between 0.1 seconds for precession uh, to, uh, to one second. It could be longer. Uh, if the disks are bigger, our simulations cannot handle that time scale, uh, but uh, they can, of course, be much, much larger. Thank you. So there are questions still coming in. So from Stella Bula, great talk with an exclamation mark. In the cases in which the jets survive, could the black hole's environment affect the jet's life? For example, in dense clouds, I suppose, entering the jet or? Yes, um, sure. So if you have uh, dense clouds uh, that are somehow shot into the jet, uh, they can. Uh, be another source of mass loading. Um, so what, what sort of context are you thinking? Are you thinking uh, uh, supermassive black holes, uh, galaxies, uh, broadline region, or, or what? Because kind of the, 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 the thing with these simulations is we hope that we don't have to like put in clouds in the simulation. Hopefully they will form self-consistently. And so we will be able to capture the physics there, right? That's kind of the idea. 
uh, behind these simulations. So it's a bit hard for me to speculate what happens, you know, how these clouds can come about because I haven't seen them. Uh, but we also include a lot of physics. Um, so I think that clouds will behave similar to the sort of instability that mix the gas in. Basically, if something enters the jet, it will bring in both uh, the magnetic flux with them, uh, with it, and also the gas. And so the uh, jet can uh, become mass loaded as a result. And also uh, the jet can maybe undergo reconnection so that the magnetic flux that are brought by whatever perturber there is, clump call it, uh, will then reconnect with the field of the jet. Uh, and that can cause some sort of uh, radiation signatures. I don't know if that's what you were thinking of. Perhaps Stella, you can, yes, thank you, she replied. So I think you answered your question. Yeah. And then we have also one from Michalis Papachristou, who is asking, saying first, thanks for this wonderful talk. And then do we have an estimation of the temperature of the low density jet surrounding gas? Do you have any cooling effects? Um. No cooling effects so far. We haven't worried about this at all whatsoever. Um, I would have to get back to you on the temperature that we get in our simulations. Um, I suspect it will be a virial temperature. Um, that's probably what the simulation will naturally uh, give you. Uh, in terms of the physics of where the heating happens, basically once the jets ram into the ambient medium, uh, initially it's completely cold. Uh, at least in the setup that I was uh, showing you over here. Uh, and uh, once the jets slam into the ambient medium, they go at the speed of light. So the jet has momentum that it carries with it uh, in the electromagnetic field. And this momentum slams into the ambient medium. And so uh, then as a result, um, all the basically drives a shock, which then heats up uh, the ambient medium. Uh, so that's what's happening there. And uh, typically, I think that uh, you would naturally heat up the gas uh, to, uh, I think it will be virial temperature. Um, but I need to think about what happens specifically in our simulation because it doesn't include gravity um, and it doesn't include the initial thermal pressure. Because it doesn't include gravity, uh, it won't be able to include the process of buoyancy, uh, where when the gas becomes hot enough and light enough, it will rise buoyantly, and then that will kind of regulate the temperature. So that's, that's what I think is happening uh, in our simulations. But there will be also other very important effects that we don't include, such as uh, cooling, like, like you, uh, you're saying. Uh, and this cooling can cause the formation of two-phase medium, so that we will have cold clumps uh, embedded in the hot gas uh, and the sort of uh, instability uh, of collapsing the cold clumps uh, might be you know, sensitive to the time scales of the outflow because it takes a while for the cool instability to kick in. So it's a little bit of a tricky question uh, here and we don't include any of that physics at all. Um, yeah, not yet at least. Thanks a lot, says Michalis. And if I may ask one final question. Yeah, of course, Maria. So uh, you started uh, your talk or you emphasized that you wanted to find situations where jets are not being produced in order to explain this small fraction, like 10% or lower for the radio loud AGM jets that we, the AGM that we know, but there is still a frac, like majority of them are radio quiet without jets. So I don't, uh, yeah, the situation that you described is that you have a very particular um, situation where you need a, a highly inclined uh, disc, a very high field, and a thin disc in order, with a toroidal magnetic field to begin with in order to quench the jet or not form the jet at all. So yeah. in your opinion, is Sorry. this like the, could this be the main explanation for the lack of jets in the 90% of AGN or could it be that the spin of the black hole is the most important parameter regulating the jet formation? Yeah, so uh, thank you. This is, this is an awesome question. So I kind of didn't go into all these details. So it's awesome to have, thank you so much for all the great questions that you've asked. This was fantastic. I'm really, really enjoying 
uh, my time being here virtually with you. I really wish I was able to visit Athens, enjoy the sun. Oh, it would be so awesome. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe like a few years from now. Uh, but in a couple of years. <laughs> yes, yes, in a couple of years, exactly. Uh, yeah. So, um, so I think that the most important effect here is perhaps not the tilt uh, for the formation of large-scale magnetic flux, and I'll explain why. I think it's really the combination of the disk thickness and the toroidal magnetic flux. So the absence of vertical magnetic flux uh, means that there will be no jet, but only if the system won't be able to produce a flux on its own, vertical flux of its own. Uh, so what we are seeing is in the previous simulation where the flux was produced, the disk was thick, whereas here the disk is thin, and that's the biggest difference uh, from the point of view sorry, of large-scale dynamo operating. Um, I don't think the tilt is going to be the crucial parameter for the following reason. Dynamo operates in a large, large scale, uh, far away where the effects of general relativity uh, are not as important. Okay, fine, the disk will be warped from time to time and so on, but I, I would imagine like right now, the outer disk is not really perturbed by the central black hole. Its connection has been lost because the disk tore. I would expect that you know, over this time period, we would see some sort of large scale uh, magnetic flux formation, but there is no sign of that. So it seems like large scale poloidal flux, as we call it, or the vertical flux dynamo is not active uh, in thin disks. Something prevents it from uh, being active. And uh, I think that, uh, Actually, it's a few factors that are acting together to prevent large-scale magnetic flux from being formed. Um, I'm not sure how much time I have to answer the question. I'm happy to give you the details. But in a nutshell, if you have a thick disk, uh, the largest scale on which the flux can be produced is the scale height of the disk, right? Scale height of the disk is comparable to the distance. So it's very easy for the disk to produce a large-scale magnetic flux loop. Um, uh, that then can fall into the black hole and produce a jet. In small thickness of the disk, the disk is tiny vertically compared to the distance, so the flux loops will be tiny. And there is no guarantee that a flux loop produced at this distance and at that distance will actually be in the same, you know, in the right orientation, so when they add up, they form a bigger loop as opposed to uh, they, they just annihilate. And so it's much harder to build something that's large scale from a thin disk. Um, because of that. Also, even producing a small scale loop on the scale height of the disk is also very hard because uh, you know, each azimuthal part of the disk produces its own dynamo. And so they need to add up together to form one uh, axisymmetric structure, which is when it shows up as a large scale, uh, uh, sorry, a, a, a poloidal field loop in a vertical slice. So I feel like all of these obstacles, uh, all of which are associated with a small aspect ratio of a thin disk, are going to make it essentially impossible or statistically implausible to produce large scale flux. Uh, a lot of things have to go in the same way globally in the thin disk, uh, which is very unlikely, uh, as opposed to a thick disk where it's much more likely to, to happen, and which is what we have observed. So I think this is the biggest difference uh, between the, uh, these two simulations, this one that doesn't have a jet and everything else. Uh, having said that, there are other ways that I can envision to kill the jet. Uh, they are not as attractive to me because I would kind of feel like I'm doing it by hand uh, because uh, we also found, I didn't have a chance to include it in the talk, uh, we also found that if we uh, do not provide a disk with large scale magnetic flux, then there are no jets or they're extremely weak. For instance, in the, in the case of the simulation with the toroidal flux, um, if we were to not insert toroidal flux of the same sign, uh, uh, the same sign everywhere, but if we were to flip the signs, you know, here it's pointing into the board, uh, and then here it's pointing out of the board, uh, and, and so on and so forth, uh, then uh, we found that there is no jet that's produced. So uh, that's why I kind of say that you need to provide some sort of large scale flux, no matter orientation, toroidal or vertical, but it has to be large scale. And what is large enough scale is, is an open question. We only tried one wavelength uh, at, you know, over which we were flipping the signs of the magnetic flux. 
so I imagine that uh, above a certain critical distance, maybe 10-ish gravitational radii, like delta R over R is 10% or something like this, maybe that's the characteristic scale, um, you know, above which the jets will be produced happily ever after and below which, you know, this kind of smaller scale magnetic fields, seed fields will uh, lead to enough chaos that uh, there will be no order born out of the chaos. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. Oh, you also so you also Answer. asked about the spin. Yes, if the spin is zero, uh, yes, it, it's yes, very hard to make a large scale relativistic jet. Um, but physically, I feel like it will be so difficult to make a black hole with a spin that is essentially zero because even a black hole with a spin of 0.3 or even a black hole with a spin of 0.2 will still produce a jet. So if we want to explain radio quiet galaxies, because one thing is, um, yeah, if we want to explain radio quiet galaxies or, or even, let's just, let's just focus on the quasars uh, where the disks are dominating uh, the ambient medium. Uh, and 90% of the quasars don't have the jets. So in this case, there is really not much choice for us. Like there is no ambient medium to stop the jet from, from forming. Uh, so it's really the dynamics of the accretion disk itself. Uh, and you know, uh, it's kind of uh, internal processes, internal bookkeeping with the magnetic fields that's, de that's determining whether the jets will be there. So I feel like the two leading candidates for switching off the jets uh, are, um, Magnetic geometry uh, and you know um, and this dynamo, um, whether it's activated or not, depending on the thickness of the disk. Of course, I could use uh, you know a switch in my simulation and set spin to be zero and say, "Ha ha, I solved the problem." The only problem with that is, I think, as Nick was asking, uh, in black hole binaries, we see uh, disks going through state transitions, and so uh, they can have a thinnish disk that produces a jet or it doesn't produce a jet, and so. It to me, it seems more uh, like uh, a, a, not a state of a black hole, but rather a state of a black hole from plus a disk system. That's why completely relying on the spin to switch off the jets would be a little bit um, unsatisfying to me, if, if you see what I'm, what I, what I'm. Yes, thinking. yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, I think that we are well over time. <laughs> Sorry so about maybe... that. I hope you enjoyed <laughs> no, it no. at least. <laughs> yeah, we enjoyed it. <laughs> Great, awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, it was such a pleasure to, to talk to you remotely. Thank you so much for having me over. Uh, sorry for the initial for... technical difficulties and I, I had a blast here. I hope you did as well and uh, I hope to keep in touch and uh, if you're around Chicago or thinking of visiting, just shoot me an email and uh, eventually in a couple of years we'll make it happen yes in a couple of years <laughs> okay thank you very thank much thank you so much everyone bye bye thank you thank bye. you Sasha. bye thank you